Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Carl, for helping organize this. Uh, we're joint hosting today with the Blockchain Association, the Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong. Um, thank you very much, Genesis Block, for hosting us. Um, this is a great space. Thank you all for uh, showing up. I'm going to be talking about um, Bitcoin security. Um, and that mostly means um, keeping your private keys safe. Um, so as a bit of background about how Bitcoin works, um, I think all that you really need to know is that Bitcoins aren't specific files um, that you send around. Um, they aren't like sending somebody an image, or they aren't like sending somebody um, even a piece of information. But rather, Bitcoin transactions are signed messages. Um, they're signed messages similar to uh, checks. Um, and they're signed with a digital signature. Now, that digital signature requires a private key. This private key, you can imagine, as just being a, a large random number. Um, this random number is small enough that you would be able to um, write it by hand on a piece of paper. Um, it's relatively easy to store. Um, but that also makes it relatively easy to be hacked or relatively easy to be stolen. And the Bitcoin blockchain, the network, is not really able to distinguish between the real owner as in the legal owner, or as in the rightful owner of a Bitcoin. Um, but rather, um, it's just able to tell whether the private key is correct, whether the signature is correct. So for somebody to steal your Bitcoins, what that really means is that they steal this private key. They steal the secret number, and they um, use it to sign messages that the network then accepts as coming from you. Um, kind of like somebody being able to um, steal your checkbook um, and forging your signature um, because they know exactly what it looks like. Um, and then without the ability for you to get your money back, um, without the ability for you to set, close the other person's account, uh, because it's a Bitcoin. And in Bitcoin, uh, we cannot do these things. Um, a lot of Bitcoin security has to do with trade-offs. Um, and I think Bitcoin can be very intimidating in terms of how many options you have to store your Bitcoin. Um, if we're talking about something like PayPal, um, then there's only one website. There's only PayPal.com. You can only keep your money there. Um, there's a clear step-by-step -step procedure on how to open these accounts and then how to secure them. Um, if you want to do more, you cannot. PayPal doesn't allow you. And if you want to do less, um, then PayPal might remind you uh, that you have to do more. And with Bitcoin, it's a bit of a uh, blessing um, and, a, um, and a problem that you have millions and millions of options. Um, and that when you design your Bitcoin security, you're very free in deciding on exactly those trade-offs uh, between how easy should your Bitcoin be accessible and how secure um, should they be. Before we can um, discuss a bit in detail about what these trade-offs look like or what options we have, I think we need to talk a bit about general computer security. Um, because your phone might not necessarily be secure, or your computer might not necessarily be secure. Um, so you might even run into Bitcoin security problems um, before we even start talking about Bitcoin. Um, when in Bitcoin security, um, or in information security, often we don't really worry enough about whether we we're being hacked or not. Um, if you remember, maybe five or 10 years ago, it was relatively common for people to have all sorts of software on their computer running that they don't want. Uh, imagine, remember when the Internet Explorer had these like hundreds and hundreds of search bars uh, because there wasn't really a way to conveniently um, ma make money from um, malware. All you can really do is show advertisement to your victim. Um, and a victim would probably be, um, well, pretty different um, to that advertisement because they would see advertisement all the time anyway. Um, and so why bother removing that? Um, over the last years, and I've also had to do a bit with Bitcoin, um, we've seen a different type of malware come up um, that is called ransomware. Um, so nowadays, um, it's much more profitable for somebody who has access to your computer or who serves you malware to serve you a piece of software that encrypts your data, meaning um, they turn your data into a gibberish and um, they keep the key and they will ask you to pay a ransom to get your data back. Um, and that is also a bit of a, a blessing in disguise. And it's really unfortunate for people who have been hit um, with this type of malware. But it is a um, type of malware that has made people a lot more aware um, of their um, computer security. 
um, and something that has made computer insecurity uh, very visible. If you today take an old, unpatched computer, let's say a Windows XP machine that has never really even gotten Service Pack 2, um, you're not going to be able to surf around some of the sketchy parts of the internet for very long before your computer is infected with ransomware. Um, and luckily, that also means that if your computer um, is um, infected with, if, is, if your computer is currently not infected with ransomware, um, it probably is not infected with anything else either. Uh, because if it was infected with something else, if there was a security hole that a hacker could exploit to install um, something else, they would have already used that to install ransomware. Um, and I think that makes, and um, these principles make it relatively easy for us to look at this topic. Uh, so when we're now looking at how can you learn how to trust your device, um, how can we secure our accounts, it is something that everybody here in this room is going to be able to relatively easily do. It's not something that you need specific knowledge about. It's not something that you need to learn exactly how ransomware works, or how malware works, or how computers exactly work. Um, there are a few relatively easy steps that will protect you from the vast majority of threats um, that are coming out there. Um, and we're also going to be later to go into a little bit more complicated stuff, um, because it's fun to think about, and because it's a great demonstration of the things that Bitcoin can do. Um, so we're going to be talking about what if somebody really powerful and wealthy is going after your money, like a professional international criminal organization. Um, before we are talking about um, computers even, or phones even, I think it's a relatively good idea to um, mention that securing your bitcoins also has to do with keeping your bitcoins yourself, um, meaning you make your bitcoins secure by holding them on your own device. Um, by holding them on your own phone, on your own computer, on your own piece of paper, on your own hardware wallet, um, rather than handing them out to strangers. Um, I think, especially um, if you have only been in cryptocurrencies for half a year or a year, or maybe even two years, um, it's not that obvious how shortly many of these platforms have been around. Um, that many of these platforms have been around for as long as you have been around. Um, for as long as I have been around, um, for that there are very few that have been around for more than three or four years. Um, very few where we can say they have a good track record. Um, and it's very likely that the um, expected time, life expectancy of an exchange is relatively similar to its age. Um, I don't want to bash exchanges in general, but these companies are startups, like other startups too, and they are going to fail. Um, and they might even fail within the next year. If an exchange is a year old, no matter how large it is, it is not a given that it's going to be still around in 10 years. Um, there's many, many problems that could come to an exchange. Not that I want to um, scare you, but um, there's the possibility that the exchange simply goes bankrupt, or that the exchange gets hacked, or that the exchange runs into legal problems, um, that somebody is seizing the money legally, meaning you no longer have access to it. Um, 2014, Mount Gox went bankrupt. Um, and they have been underwater, meaning they haven't had the Bitcoins that they pretended to have um, for pretty much their entire existence. They were bound to go bankrupt eventually. Um, the Japanese courts, um, they awarded their creditors with a certain, with an X amount of Japanese yen, and now that the price of Bitcoin has increased so much, luckily people are going to get um, their money back, but only what they owned um, they, what they owned in 2014 as valued in yen, um, meaning they had to leave out on all these Bitcoin gains. Um, I think it's relatively likely that Bitcoin is still going to be around in five or ten years, and it's very unlikely that these exchanges will be. Um, so, especially if you're thinking about a long time horizon, and that a long time horizon in cryptocurrencies might be half a year, um, you really don't um, want to keep your money on an exchange. And if you do want to keep it on an exchange, there has to be some kind of compensation. And to be honest, I personally don't think that any of the compensation that exchanges do offer, for example, interest rates, um, is enough to, um, to uh, really adequately compensate the counterparty risk. Yes, please. Would you feel the Japanese market is a, or the Japanese uh, exchanges might be more dependable since the government there is, is, seems to be stepping in the right uh, way? Maybe that also makes them more undependable, right? Because the government can at any time just seize the funds and stop the exchanges. Um, Maybe that's a different kind of risk than 
um, being hacked, or maybe that's a different kind of risk than shutting down because the startup is underfunded, um, but it is certainly a risk. And I don't actually think there are any benefits really to keeping your uh, coins in an exchange. If you're a trader, um, then you're not an investor, and you're doing something completely different, something that we're not going to talk to about today. Um, but then the security models look entirely different. Um, so remember what I was mentioning about uh, devices. Um, so now we all have devices, right? We all have our smartphones, we all have our laptops, our computers. Um, we, have, we might even have hardware wallets already. Um, and we can somewhat assume that they are safe. Um, as I mentioned before, if they weren't, there probably already be one somewhere on it. Um, they would probably already be some kind of, uh, exhibit some kind of funky behavior. Um, if you're not worried about, if you're worried about your device uh, possibly not being safe, um, you should factory reset it. Um, so you go to your phone um, and, factory, and reset your phone to factory settings, meaning you kind of start out from fresh. That works especially well on iPhones, uh, works well on uh, most Android devices. On Android devices, you can be extra sure by reinstalling the operating system. That might already be too much trouble. Um, and on the latest Windows and Mac machines, um, you can also do that on your laptops. Once you have ensured that your device is up to date and new, you need to keep it up to date. Um, it's relatively, so all our software, all our devices have security holes. It's pretty much inevitable. Um, but they are, these security holes are not commonly known, uh, meaning you won't be able to look up um, what security holes are there for the latest iPhone and then be able to use it. Um, because the second these security holes become public, um, Apple will patch them and Android will also patch them. Um, meaning that if you do have a security hole, um, it's going to be very valuable if you have found one yourself. Um, after hours and hours of research, um, you might be able to sell that security vulnerability. Or you might be able to use it against a target. Um, but you wouldn't be able to use it against all iPhone users at the same time um, because you would be discovered in that process. You would, if you try to target everybody, um, you would also target security research and, and Apple engineers who would very quickly realize what you're doing and shut you down. And that's a little bit, we're going to the end, end to it in the end. And um, what if we're worried about um, those types of attacks as well? Um, the other stuff is also relatively um, straightforward. Nowadays, malware doesn't so much um, come, is installed by um, browsing a shady website, but rather people install it voluntarily themselves. So you have to be really careful with what kind of software you're installing. Um, because that could be malware, right? If you're um, finding out, hey, there's a, a new Bitcoin fork, claim your free tokens now, then you have to be really sure that the software that you're downloading, this um, Bitcoin fork wallet, is really um, what it says it is and is not malware. Um, because it very well could be. And if you're installing it yourself, then no <laughs> antivirus and no up-to-date <laughs> computer is going to be able to uh, protect you from that. Um, the that is also uh, very true for pirated software. Um, pirated software that might include the latest version of uh, Photoshop that you really want to have, but that you don't want to pay for. Um, and that used to be something that um, people just did at home to crack software and make it available for free. And today, it's become relatively difficult to do so, uh, meaning the type of groups that still do this, they don't do that for free, but they do this as a business. And as a business means, they either want you to pay them instead of paying Adobe, um, or they're going to steal something from you, or they're going to infect you with ransomware, because they want to make money somehow and be compensated for their efforts. Now, we have a secure phone, and we have a secure computer. Um, we also need to worry a bit about our accounts. Um, our accounts, in this case, really mostly means, like, uh, uh, the most important account um, is going to be your email account. Um, the reason is that somebody who has access to your email account is able to reset the passwords on your exchanges, uh, on your social media platforms, is going to be able to simply go to any website that you have an account with and say, I forgot my password, please send me a new one. And this new password is going to end up straight in your email inbox that they now have access to. Um, so really be careful with um, your email account. I think two-factor authentication today is a must. And for two-factor authentication today, uh, we have largely three um, distinct options. Um, now, the first option is getting these codes 
by text message. So I hope you're all familiar with the general concept of uh, two-factor authentication. Um, it means that you not only log into Gmail or iCloud with your password, um, but you also get to send a secondary password that is time sensitive, so it's only valid for a few minutes, um, to your phone or to your app, um, or keep it on a, on a hardware device. Now, the first option, SMS, is usually the most commonly offered one. It's usually the most convenient one. Um, and it has the advantage that, especially if you have a subscription, if you have a contract with a, a mobile phone company, then you're not really going to lose your number. Um, meaning, even if you lose your phone, if your phone breaks, if your SIM card rusts or gets, um, gets uh, uh, like uh, damaged, um, then you will still be able to go back to China Mobile or to 3 and ask for a new SIM card. Um, and this is a system that can also be abused to hack you, uh, meaning this is something that has happened quite frequently in the United States especially, uh, where it seems relatively difficult and relatively easy to get a new SIM card issue. Um, you can call up uh, T-Mobile, you can call up Verizon and say, I'm going to this conference, I'm out of town, I'm in this hotel outside Chicago, please send me as quickly as you can a new um, a new SIM card because I lost mine. They will just send it to some random stranger without doing a lot of verification. Um, it's a bit unfortunate. There's also different attacks that allow them to forward all calls or all text messages to a new number. Um, in Hong Kong, I would say um, we're relatively safe from that. Um, I mean, I have tried to port numbers and I have tried to get new SIM cards. In Hong Kong, you know, everything is running on paper, everything is running um, in person. Um, it can be very annoying to have to go to a branch every time. Um, but in a branch, it's much more difficult for a hacker to impersonate you um, because they're also going to be asked for their ID. Um, and it all gets more, more and more difficult. If you are worried about this, but you need to use SMS to factor authentication, um, you can get from, certainly from um, Smartone and from China Mobile, I believe also from 3, um, prepaid SIM cards. Um, that come with like a, a backup option, meaning you can buy the prepaid SIM card. Um, it's going to say, you know, when you punch out the card, um, you keep the other part, and the other part is going to say um, the serial number of the card, and that in case you lose your SIM card, you're going to be able to get it back um, with this chip. So then you have an unregistered SIM card, um, unregistered as in not registered to your name. Um, and these SIM cards cannot be ported. Um, and the only way to clone these SIM cards, or any way to get these SIM cards back, would be to have the, the other part, um, the, the punched out part of the SIM card. Meaning as long as you keep that somewhere safe, maybe in a, in a safety deposit box, um, you have the benefits of getting back your number if you lose it, um, and um, still not having to be afraid of somebody cloning and impersonating you, cloning your number. Um, but there are better options than a text message. Um, so one thing are apps. Um, Google Auth is probably the most um, commonly supported one, especially by Bitcoin exchanges. Um, and it creates a um, backup code, a two-factor code on your device. Uh, meaning if you want to log into, um, into your accounts, you need to enter your password um, and then ask for it. You ask for the secondary password, which you get by opening your phone um, and just typing in whatever number it shows you, which changes every 30 seconds or so. Um, the benefit of that is it works even if you don't have a cell phone reception, even if you're traveling, even if you have a different SIM card in it, you're still going to get those codes. Um, but it has a downside that it's much more difficult to back up. And if you break your phone, you might also um, lose these keys. Um, meaning then you have to go to back up all your accounts and, um, and regenerate um, regain access, uh, which usually in a Bitcoin exchange works like your account is locked for seven days, you have to prove your identity again, you have to upload some handwritten document stating why you lost access to your two-factor authentication key or um, who you are and your, your ID numbers. Um, I think the, the last one is by far the coolest. Um, FIDO U2F is the standard. So FIDO Universal Two-Factor. It has the, it looks like a like a little key um, that you plug into your USB drive and um, it generates a key automatically for you. You just need to press the button and then you're um, logged in. The big benefit is that this 
um, cannot be phished, meaning even if you were to be sent to a fake Google website, and this fake Google website asks you for your password, then you might be tricked into giving your, the fake Google site your real Google password. Um, now, a fake, this fake Google site uh, might also be asking for your Google auth number or for your text message number, um, and then use those to gain access to your account. Uh, but if you have like such a Fido UTF key, um, this um, theoretically cannot happen. Um, I don't believe there are any public cases of, um, of this having been breached or the security standard having been broken um, because the key will verify that you're really talking to the correct website and that you're really talking to google.com and not to google.com hyphen security.ru um, slash info. Um, these keys are relatively cheap. Um, you should be able to uh, buy some for five US dollars a piece or for 10 US dollars a piece. I think the most prominent ones built by Yubico cost about 20 US dollars, although you can get some bulk discounts. Um, great idea for yourself or for um, organizations. Um, I believe the latest Trezor even um, works as a file UTF key. So if you do have a hardware wallet, um, it might work for logging into a site as well. So now we're finally going to get to the, the great, the good part, the Bitcoin part. Um, who, so coming back to um, having so many options that you that we can protect ourselves from in Bitcoin, um, I think it's worth it to talk about exactly what we are protecting us from. And this might be something that is different for each one of us. Um, each one of us has access to different things. Some of us might already have a safety deposit box in a bank that we trust. Um, others might not trust banks at all. Um, some of us might be worried about governments. Um, they might be worried about um, their government seizing their Bitcoin. And others are going to be worried about um, information security, right? They're going to be worried about hackers stealing their Bitcoin. Um, some of us are going to put a lot of trust in their own um, IT capabilities, meaning some of you are going to trust yourself with keeping a computer um, are running and not getting hacked, and others might not trust themselves at all about this. Um, some might trust their brain a lot more than others, um, and others, like for example, fear things like illness, um, or fear things like accident and death. Um, and all these things matter when we think about how to secure Bitcoin, um, especially when it comes to um, securing Bitcoins in the long run. Like, I want to make, I want to buy one Bitcoin today, and I want to put that into my uh, my newborn kid's um, college fund, right? Or maybe not a, not the best idea, but um, sort of as a, um, you know, you, you endow a newborn child with a Bitcoin, who knows, maybe uh, maybe it's gonna make uh, the kid's life a lot easier in 20 years when the kid is like um, entering, well, starting their own life. Um, so, but how do you do that, right? How do you um, keep a Bitcoin in a way that you don't have to worry about it for 20 years, um, that, that still cannot be stolen? Um, that kid A suddenly has its Bitcoin stolen, and kid B doesn't, and then um, how do you reconcile that, right? Um, so, because we also use Bitcoin for different things, um, we might use Bitcoin for spending, uh, because we go to a cafe and spend Bitcoins, um, we might spend our Bitcoins on online purchases, um, but we also might keep them for saving. Um, there are quite a few um, different options that we have, and I like to use this quadrant here, um, because I think it's a meaningful distinction as to um, what kind of option we should choose. Um, this, these four options are again completely different. Um, let's start with let's start with the bottom counterintuitively. Um, imagine we have relatively few bitcoins, really so few bitcoins that we don't want to invest in a hardware wallet. We don't want to worry too much about it, and we also don't use them very often. Um, I think in this case, this is probably the best case for an online wallet um, because you don't have to think about too many things. Um, it's probably also not the most secure uh, to put your Bitcoin into an online wallet, but if it's just 200 Hong Kong dollars um, and if you don't actually intend to use it in the next few months, might as well open an account with a company like blockchain.info, um, verify yourself with your email address um, so that you don't have to worry about too many things. You still have to worry about your password um, somewhat. Um, but that's a relatively um, like easy thing to, to back up, right? And then, yeah, you can always come back into the online wallet um, and sign in um, 
and to get the Bitcoin back without worrying about where are they now. Um, but if you make a lot of transactions, then you might already not trust an online wallet anymore. Um, maybe this doesn't even have to do directly with security. Uh, maybe it simply has to do with availability. An online wallet can be, can be down for, um, for a few hours. Uh, maybe exactly that time when you need to make a transaction. Um, you can use a, a mobile wallet, for example, in a case like this. I think mm, our modern telephones, uh, our smartphones, um, they're able to, um, they're, they're more than secure enough to be able to keep um, a sizable amount of money on them, meaning as much money as you would be comfortable carrying with you on person. Um, you don't have to, they, they are, there are possible ways to attack um, a mobile wallet, but not at the cost that makes it attractive to target people who only have a few thousand Hong Kong dollars on their, on their wallet, which actually I think is already quite a lot, uh, which probably few of us would keep in cash with them. Um, if we make um, a, large, um, a large investment, and we want to keep that investment for a long time, meaning we make very few transactions with that money over the years, um, then we run into the problem that pretty much all of these other options, like online wallets, mobile wallets, hardware wallets, um, still requires to have some kind of backup. Um, so with a mobile wallet, we're going to have the Bitcoin keys on our phone, but we're also going to have these Bitcoin keys as a backup on a piece of paper somewhere. Um, but if we don't actually use the mobile wallet, why worry about that part? Why not create a wallet that only exists on the piece of paper, um, so that we only have to worry about one thing um, that we then some secure for a long time? The last thing is the hardware wallet. Um, so if we actually, let's say we are in a company, we need to make payroll regularly, or we need to pay suppliers and they take Bitcoin, um, then a hardware wallet might be a lot better of an option. Um, a hardware wallet is a special chip that holds your um, secret keys um, in a way that cannot be easily extracted by malware. Um, for example, um, this key, this chip, um, demands that you press a button every time something is signed. So no message can ever be signed without you physically pressing that, um, that button, even if somebody is in full control of your computer and already hacked everything. Um, this hard hardware wallets cost a bit of money. Um, if you are really having large value and frequent transactions, it's definitely going to be worth it. Um, and they are still going to require some kind of paper wallet backup. Uh, meaning you're still going to have somewhat the problem that um, you're going to need to keep a paper somewhere, but they're far more convenient if you regularly want to spend Bitcoin than every time, like resetting up your tent in your living room, um, putting yourself in there, loading your um, private keys into the computer, signing a transaction, and figuring out how to broadcast that. Now, the other four distinctions, um, they might apply to all of these things. I think generally a hot wallet would Always, an online wallet would always be a hot wallet, um, but for example, um, these other types of wallets, a mobile wallet um, or a paper wallet, they can be in a sense hot or cold. What we mean with this is whether your wallet is directly connected to the internet or not. Um, so generally, hot wallets are convenient, they're accessible. Um, your mobile phone is a classical hot wallet because it connects directly to the internet and allows you to immediately broadcast a transaction um, to the network. While you might have a mobile wallet on a laptop where you have removed um, pretty much all um, networking parts from the laptop to be able to prevent anybody from hacking it. So it's a laptop that never gets connected to the internet, um, which makes it a lot more difficult to attack, but also makes it a lot less convenient to make a transaction um, because you're somehow going to have to um, inform that computer about what transaction to sign, then you have to sign the transaction, you have to again take the transaction and broadcast it um, to the network. Without, you don't want to connect it to the internet, right? So you're going to have to work with um, either QR codes or with infrared um, or with USB sticks, which all carry their own risks. Um, now, multi signature solutions. Do you have, a, do you have something on multi signature solutions? Um, hot wallets, 
um, cold wallets, hardware wallets, and there's nothing on it. <coughs> Let's talk about multi-signature solutions. Um, because that's where you can get really creative. Um, so a multi-signature wallet is something relatively similar to a multi-signature bank account, at least in principle. Um, the difference is that these things don't require you to trust a bank. Um, if you instruct your bank to add new signatories to your account, uh, for example, because you want to um, add your spouse or because you want to add your business partner, um, then you not only um, trust your spouse, your business partner, but you also trust the bank with really keeping those rules. Uh, for example, in a bank too, you can tell the bank that only the business partner or you can sign together with the accountant. Um, but what if the bank decides to, um, to change the rules? Or what if somebody tricks the bank into changing the rules? And this is not possible on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, yet the principle is the same. You can create a Bitcoin address, um, meaning you can create a Bitcoin account, um, that has multiple signatories. Um, those can be two signatories, those can be five signatories, um, can actually theoretically go um, relatively high, up to 12, um, but it's not common to have more than like three or four. Um, and you can define rules for those accounts, uh, meaning a common rule would be to have two signatories and both signatures need to be present, meaning both signatories have to sign every transaction. And another common rule is a two out of three account, meaning there are three signatories and two of them um, need to sign a transaction. And there are now lots of ways um, we, can, we can use this for. Um, for example, I can distribute these three signatures um, among myself. Um, I can say one signature should be on my phone. Another signature is my computer, my laptop. And a third signature is a paper backup that I keep in a safety deposit box. And this allows me to, without having invested really in a hardware wallet, without having really um, create some complicated legal arrangement, um, to already make it magnitudes more difficult um, to get hacked. Um, because now, for somebody, if somebody hacks my computer, they only have one of these three keys. And one of these keys is not enough to um, send my money. Um, and to hack, so and if they, the same if they had to hack my, my phone. Um, if the government or the bank seizes my, um, my private key in the bank deposit box, um, or if the bank burns down, then I'm also not really worried about losing my Bitcoin in this case. Um, the barrier for anybody to um, steal my funds um, becomes, I would say it multiplies, um, so it, um, um, it squares um, in difficulty, because now they not only have to hack my computer, but they also have to hack my phone. Um, if, the, if the bank wants to take my Bitcoins, they not only have to seize the piece of paper from my bank deposit box, but they also have to hack my phone, um, which is probably not something they, they, hopefully not something they do a lot. Um, so something that's very difficult and expensive for them. Um, if I use my phone, um, then I still have, then of course I cannot immediately make a Bitcoin transaction because the, the laptop is not enough, but I will have to go back to the bank deposit box and retrieve my recovery key and send my funds to a new account that I've set up, maybe with the same rules. Um, so this is not something where um, you have to be too much worried about um, losing those, um, losing those uh, coins to, to uh, loss. Um, there's also ways to um, create, create things differently. Um, some people might be more comfortable with keeping the third key in an encrypted um, storage somewhere at home, um, but of course that means that they no longer need to trust the bank, and they no longer need to keep a key of the safety deposit box somewhere, but suddenly they need to remember another password, um, or suddenly they need to keep another encryption key somewhere. Um, but lots and lots of options um, that, yeah, probably um, create a similar sense of security than a hardware wallet. Um, now, hardware wallet can also come into play in this. Um, you could use a mobile phone, a hardware wallet, and a paper wallet um, as a two or three multi-signature. Or you can have two hardware wallets um, that both are needed to sign on, and so on and on. You can really, depending on what you're afraid of, um, you, can, um, you can distribute 
um, these keys as you want across different um, wallets. Um, the other thing that you can do with a multi-signature wallet is distribute keys globally. Um, this is something that's very fascinating if you think a bit about um, geopolitics and if you think about legal systems, um, because the theoretically, um, if you are an organization that keeps, let's say you are a fund um, that wants to keep Bitcoin secure, um, then you then simply keeping coins um, in your brain might not be an option because the organization doesn't have a single brain. Um, the organization doesn't want to trust a sim single person with a single uh, brain, uh, with a single key. Um, this person might be kidnapped. This person might be um, might be legally pressured. Uh, maybe in most um, jurisdictions around the world, this person that remembers the key has some kind of legal protection to not be forced to, um, for example, say this key out loud in an interrogation situation. But this legal protection is relatively shaky. Uh, we don't have a lot of what we call liberal democracies. Um, now, to, let's say you want to use a, a paper wallet um, to mitigate against this, then there are, again, lots of legal tricks that your competitor or that a government um, could use to retrieve this piece of information. Um, theoretically, Bitcoin wallets can be, since paper wallets, since they're just information, they can be subpoenaed just like anything else. Um, but if you distribute your keys globally, um, you can spread out that risk um, legally as well. Uh, for example, by using different legal um, uh, jurisdictions um, that are unlikely to cooperate with each other uh, means that now somebody who wants to subpoena your Bitcoin and take your Bitcoin, they need to subpoena like multiple wallets at once, uh, maybe leaving you enough time to move the funds to the wallet uh, unless there's a um, unless there's some um, trouble there as well. Um, so, for example, what could that be, right? Um, now, somebody who um, might already be a global fund uh, would be able to go to Switzerland and deposit a paper wallet key somewhere in the mountains. They might at the same time um, give a copy to their lawyer uh, in the United States um, and at the same time uh, put, a, um, put a piece of paper into a uh, private bank in the Caribbean. And that creates a relatively um, diverse um, um, that creates a relatively diverse uh, attack surface um, that can be very difficult to exploit all at once. Um, and there's lots of um, lots of needed cases that are probably more likely than a government going after you. Um, but it's a it's a fascinating uh, mental exercise for for lawyers and how to how to spread um, risk around legal systems globally that hasn't in the same way. Um, um, existed really uh, before Bitcoin. Now, uh, before we forget, of course, we don't just have to distribute these keys among ourselves. Uh, we can also create, uh, put, give these keys to third parties. Uh, we can use third parties as um, as trustees. Um, there is somewhat trust in the world. Um, it does exist. Um, there is more importantly um, shared wealth, uh, meaning there. Um, the entire idea of a company is that multiple people come together for a um, somewhat a business endeavor, and this business endeavor is going to require them to hold funds. And now, a, uh, if this uh, business endeavor involves Bitcoin, um, they would be able to create a multi-signature wallet that sort of um, resembles whatever rules they have laid out in their articles of association uh, or in their partnership contract. Um, so they would be able to say there are three directors, and two of these directors are needed um, to, uh, to sign a transaction. Uh, or there are two directors, and um, a third um, cop, and two of these directors need to sign. And in case um, something happens, there is a third key with a trusted notary, uh, or with a trusted um, third person. Uh, maybe the first employee who came on board, or maybe this key doesn't lie with a um, an individual, but rather lies with an institution, uh, for example, the accountant. Um, now, the accountant does, is not able to, to run away with those points um, uh, unless they collude with one of the two. Uh, so there's a bit of a trust involved. But the um, two directors will be able to pretty much freely go on their business, um, and only 
go to their notary or to their lawyer or to their accountant in case something happens. And that something happens might be a um, horrible accident, but it might be more likely a hard drive failure. Um, or it might be um, yeah, simply somebody forgetting a password. Um, so all these things um, being taken care of. Um, what I want to go into now is um, I want to introduce you to a operating system that I'm going to uh, that I regularly use to create uh, Bitcoin wallets, um, and I specifically like this to create uh, paper wallets um, for the following reasons. Um, so I want to create a paper wallet that I can really fully trust, where I don't have to worry about oh, what if that program I downloaded last month was malware? Uh, what if somebody was spying on me, um, what if somebody has introduced some kind of dumb, some kind of malware onto my computer to spy on me. Um, so whenever I want to create a paper wallet, I want to install it kind of like on a fresh computer. I am still trusting my hardware somewhat. Um, so I'm still trusting that nobody really messed with my hardware, um, for example. Um, yeah insert a keylogger or things like this, even though theoretically it should also protect the keylogger. Um, but the idea is that I have a operating system on a USB stick. Um, I can download that myself, I can, um, if you want, I think you can get a, a pop too. Um, and I can take whatever computer I have and somewhat trust. I don't need to trust the software of my computer. I only need to somewhat trust the hardware, uh, which is a lot more difficult to um, and a lot less likely to be compromised. Um, and I can start that computer from this operating system from scratch, as if this computer had never been used before. It's gonna not remember anything. It's gonna not have any settings uh, changed. It's not gonna, it's only gonna come with the pre-installed software, uh, which I hope, um, given that it's um, open source software and relatively popular software, has been somewhat audited um, against really uh, malicious attacks. Um, I can show you what it looks like. It's pretty blank. Here, this is the this is the uh, presentation today. All these folders should be, be empty, and it comes with a Bitcoin wallet. Um, it comes with Electrum. Now, every time I shut down this computer, the computer forgets everything. Um, this is what it means here with uh, persistence. Um, that none of the data is persistent, none of the data stays. I can change it to um, remember stuff, but that's not really what I want to do. I want to, well, I want my computer to forget. Um, so I'm gonna ignore this warning. And it starts as if Electrum had never been um, started before. Computer is gonna be a bit slow since remember we're running an operating system from a USB stick rather than from the hard drive. So the hard drive of this computer is not turned on right now. It's not even being, being touched. Um, and I can create um, just any kind of wallet. I can create a multi-signature wallet. I can decide how many, here 15 keys, that's how many I can have. So I want to have um, a two or three wallet, meaning I want to create three signatures and um, set the rules so that two of these signatures are needed to make a transaction. I'm going to create a new scene. And now, of course, I would never be able to send money to this uh, seat um, because there are cameras here. There's one in the back, there's one here on the side, there's one somewhere here on the ceiling, um, and you have all seen them. You can take pictures. Um, so ideally, I would now be in somewhat an environment where there are no cameras and there's nobody watching. I'm not going to do this in a public cafe. And even at home, I'm going to be relatively careful that nobody looks in from the windows. I think the most, um, there's, a, there's a movie called Citizen Four, um, which is uh, set in Hong Kong, if you remember 2013, when we got uh, high visits. Um, it also popularizes this uh, operating system. And in that movie, um, Edward Snowden pulls over the blankets over his uh, computer to enter the password so that everybody knows he's watching. I think that's what super paranoid people do. You can do that if, you really, if it gives you the peace of mind. I think uh, a more convenient option would probably be to set up a tent, as I mentioned earlier, and sit inside a tent. A tent. Um, but you would now be able to 
um, write this down, right? And let me, I'm not going to write it down, but rather I'm going to copy paste it, which from a security perspective is a very bad idea. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, because <coughs> it's going to ask you to confirm it as a measure that you don't accidentally write and forget it, forget a word, and then really get annoyed years later when you get your money back. This is the public key that you need to uh, record, so that when you do need to, um, well, that when you do need to um, write down or copy over somewhat. Um, and then it would ask us to continue so and so along with the, with the second key. I'm not going to go through all these options now, uh, but basically you do this three times. And you can do this three times in the same location. Um, you can also abort now and then move to the fly to Switzerland, um, sit inside of the cave, um, and uh, if you don't like the, the tunnels and people the cave, um, and then you would enter, you would go through that process again. Um, this time only with the public key as key one, and then creating sort of a, um, creating a new key for uh, key two. Um, what else is there to know about this? Um, so if we were to do this, if we were to do this a little bit um, um, simpler, saying we only create um, a one-of-one one address, or a traditional Bitcoin address um, that doesn't have uh, multiple signatories, um, we can use this. So this works again. Um, we can use the um, public key part here to create a watch-only address. And I'm just going to quickly show you what this looks like. Um, opening Electrum Wallet shows us exactly the same warning. It didn't remember anything. Um, we're going to create a standard wallet and we're going to use our public keys. Copy paste this public key. And start the wallet. Now, what this has done is it creates a watch only wallet. And watch only wallets are very powerful in this context. Um, because these watch only wallets don't actually contain your private information. They don't contain your Bitcoin private keys. Um, meaning, this watch only wallet, you're going to be able to safely use on your everyday computer, uh, for example, to request payments or to send money to it. Uh, because on this watch only wallet, you can see, um, you're going to be able to see all your addresses and see how much balance they have um, by connecting to the internet. Remember that problem of if you have a cold wallet, you're not really able to, um, to conveniently see even how much money you have. And this solves this problem by keeping, a, keeping your private keys on a computer that is not connected to the internet or on a piece of paper um, and using this watch only wallet, for example, to um, see if, if you still have your money, um, or to request payments, um, and that's then how you can fund your um, you can fund your Bitcoin wallet, um, and for example, make slowly monthly contributions to it if you want to um, save up in the long run. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. The uh, watch only wallet is how is it connected to the cold wallet? Um, it's connected. So it's a mathematically very interesting way in that they share, they have exactly the same addresses, meaning all the addresses are known to the watch only wallet, but the watch only wallet doesn't have your uh, private keys. Um, so if you um, then want to spend those bitcoins, maybe um, you can buy something with it, hopefully they appreciate the value over time, um, you would be able to um, go back to your tent, enter your, um, enter your uh, private keys, and then sort of sign the message to spend uh, the coins. Um, we're going to move over now to the Q&A session. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for, for paying attention until now. Um, we do have a lot of questions around uh, Bitcoin security and private keys. And one thing I didn't really talk about was other points. Um, I think in principle, all points are similar, um, as in most.
cryptocurrency altcoins um, are going to be almost identical, with the only difference being that software is not as wildly available, um, as in you're going to have this operating system, for example, only comes with a, a Bitcoin wallet. And I'm not really aware of any that come with like a Litecoin wallet, for example. Um, but for the most cryptocurrencies, depending on how popular they are, um, wallets exist. Um, and the principle of the Bitcoin private key pair always the same. The major difference lies in Ethereum, um, where multi-signature wallets work very different. Um, if they're implemented as a smart contract, which more a little weird, kind of weird, weird complication of the difference. Uh, do uh, banks that store, uh, that have safe deposit box, have any term in their safety deposit box contract that prohibits you from storing uh, cold water? I'm just going to say no, um, because so I'm pretty sure about that. Liability. liability. If, if they lose that for whatever reason, and Bank of China lost uh, someone's safety yeah. deposit box. So I don't know about that. Um, I, the reason why I said no to the first question I'm just sure they didn't manage to upgrade their terms of service in time. Um, they, maybe they're not comfortable with keeping those walls. But they might have other restrictions um, that could later be interpreted as restrictions. So they might, um, they might, for example, prohibit you from putting in bearer bonds. Um, bearer bonds, which are, which can also be very valuable, which are kind of like, imagine like a one billion dollar bond. Um, that one million dollar bond that comes in a single piece of paper, um, and whoever has that piece of paper can redeem the million dollars. Um, those still exist. Um, I don't know how common they still are, but maybe the bank would prohibit you from putting those on because they're a security risk. Um, but actually, we don't know. And I would generally go say that you are supposed to put stuff of value in there. Right? It's not it's not a mailbox. It's meant to be protected from theft. It's meant to be that one place where you can comfortably put in gold bars, jewelry. Um, yeah, Felix was first, and then uh, uh, Great talk, thank you very much. I would just like to make a quick comment. Uh, the version of Electrum is quite outdated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I definitely recommend checking uh, for a version starting with the three main version yeah. and whatever is now on. Yeah. Because um, it might happen, we actually had I actually had this problem. Somebody downloaded like the version, and the protocol where it talks to Electron server has changed, and he never re he never saw the stuff the funds I sent him being received. There's actually also one security vulnerability in two seven nine. Um, just just download the yeah. most um, recent so version. The security vulnerability should be certainly fixed um, if I update this now. Um, so that's uh, that's for example one of the downsides, right? I mean, it's not, a, it's not a big relevant downside, but it's something to easily forget. Because this, I don't connect to the internet. Uh, so this doesn't check for updates either. Um, and so then if I, um, if I use this once a month, twice a month, I don't immediately <coughs> check for updates. Uh, but it is also possible. So I could now go into the Wi-Fi, or I, can, I could plug in a, I could plug in a, uh, a network cable, update the software, Turn the computer off so that it gets everything. The software is still going to be up to date. Um, thanks. Yeah. Would you recommend any specific online wallets? I mean, blockchain and info is quite popular, but I actually wouldn't really recommend them in the sense of like, <coughs> if you if it's if you're making your first steps into cryptocurrency and you don't know if you're ever going to come back to this and you put in a small amount, then I would say, yeah, just download blockchain on info or just go to the website, set up a wallet, just so that you can make the first transaction. But already, if you intend to use this again within a few months, or if you intend to put in more money, I would say, get a wallet on your phone that really keeps the keys on your phone. Um, or, so what are those, what are some wallets? Um, so I'm just on iOS, I'm still using Red Wallet. Um, I think it's quite solid, uh, not like, Super excited or happy about it. What about um, Jax or other ones? So, big um, so Jax, I actually really don't know. I think they're more like an online wallet for the altcoins. I don't know how they work for Bitcoin. Um, but generally, I prefer a wallet that does only one thing. Um, so then, maybe for some of the altcoins who don't have any other option, Jax is for sure better than keeping it on an exchange. Uh, but for something like Bitcoin um, or Ethereum, where you actually have a wide variety of options. Why put it together with the uh, Jax wallet where you just concentrate on the risk? Um, 
Samurai, I think, is pretty cool for uh, Android. Um, Red Wallet also exists for Android. Excellent. Um, additional rules on the custodian, meaning I have one wallet on my computer that has a key in it. The custodian has a server that has a key in it, two separate keys, um, that is always online. And then there's a third backup key somewhere in my safety deposit box on a piece of paper. Now, so I don't actually need to worry too much about the custodian running away with my money because they also only have one of the three keys. Um, but what I can now do is I can um, require, so I can ask the custodian to place different rules um, on these transactions. Meaning, um, I would tell the custodian that I typically don't spend more than like hundred or let's say a thousand US dollars maybe I buy a flight ticket, maximally a thousand US dollars per day. Or I would tell them, um, I only typically spend a hundred US dollars maximum per transaction, but once in a while I spend a thousand, but if I spend a thousand, I want you to call me, or I want you to send me an email, or I want you to ask for additional information. Um, and this now makes, um, this now could still mean that like, if my computer is hacked, um, then still up, because the, the, the foreign server is not going to do any checks, right? So my computer gets hacked, and somebody makes a malicious request to send 100 US dollars to the hacker. Um, now the, sub, the custodian is going to say, okay, um, but if the hacker tries to send 2,000 to themselves, the custodian is going to say, wait a second, um, we need to do additional information. Depending on what, how you set this, this can be quite a, um, so it's never going to be a tool to limit um, risk to zero, um, but it can be a very handy tool to limit exposure, as in like limit the maximum amount you can use. Because um, you can then say up to a thousand per day can be withdrawn without any verification to keep it convenient for yourself. Um, but everything, and then and you can only you lose up to a thousand US dollars per day. And how these restrictions look like, I think for uh, Bitgo should be the largest provider that offers this. Um, the type of verification they offer is. Um, sending email verification emails, asking for these keys, um, calling you, or even like for you to confirm certain things with a PGP encrypted email. So BitGo? BitGo, yeah. Um, so they certainly offer this as a service, but I don't know if they offer this like as an app to end you this action. Yes? Um, so a paper wallet basically is um, if you back up the SD public address and the, the phrase, right? Nothing else. Yeah, you just well, yeah. So you keep the, the public the public part you can comfortably keep on a computer. If that part gets stolen, then the only thing the hacker is gonna find out is how much money you have, which might be a problem, but um, if, which doesn't mean loss of funds. Um, and the the backup phrase then depending on your risk model would be either on a piece of paper or would be in an encrypted drive. Um, or would be etched into a into a piece of metal and buried somewhere in the garden. Um, yeah. So once it, once it's done, then the, the wallet can be. Uh, be yes. Yeah. So then once it's done, I shut down my computer, and then the when you go into the shutdown sequence, it wipes all the memory, um, to really make sure that everything is as it was in the beginning. So it's it's never recommended to back up the online wallet. And that as a paper wallet because, because then it's already online. online. I mean, so an online wallet you can certainly turn into a paper wallet. Um, so imagine if there are multiple, if the same key exists in multiple forms, for example, because your online wallet also exists as a paper wallet, um, it's usually the, the weakest link that you need to be worried about. And then the paper wallet is always just a backup. Um, so if the backup goes up in flames, you generate a new paper wallet, new paper wallet, paper backup um, from the online wallet. And if the online wallet disappears or you forget your password or forget your access, then you use the paper wallet to get that back. Um, also, lots of ways to combine these things. Um, I would say you're always going to have a, a paper backup of your wallet, right? Of your, of your Bitcoin wallet on your phone. If you have a hardware wallet, you're also always going to have a paper backup of it. Um, and but this, this, this is not a traditional paper wallet. Um, because the keys exist somewhere else. Um, but it is also something that's um, worth thinking about, right? If you have a single key in multiple places, you need to 
you want to be worried about these multiple places too. Because uh, so you never know, it's, you know, if your, your, your online wallet might have been already hacked, but you haven't, this fund is not even stolen, right? So if you yeah. Yeah. back it up, then yes. yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated uh, piece. I would just assume that, like, I mean, they're stolen and the funds are being moved. Um, it, of course, like, um, a sophisticated attacker would probably wait um, until you really fund a lot of money into the wallet, right? But that's like, to us in this demonstration, it's very similar to the speed map. Um, the, but you are, for example, worried about, so, let's say you take a hardware wallet um, and you don't back it up, then if you lose your hardware wallet, your money's going to go away. Or if you enter the password incorrectly too many times, because you don't realize that you're on like a French keyboard instead of an English one or something, and then your money's also going to be gone. So you do want to have some kind of backup of this, but then you also need to be worried about the backup. Um, so you have the hardware wallet, you have a piece of paper, but then anybody who can take this piece of paper um, can technically steal your funds, um, even if they don't have access to your hardware wallet. And that's where things get confusing or things get intimidating, but it's generally something that, like, um, that with a little bit of just like thinking about what am I afraid of, right? We can even, we can even write this on a piece of paper. What am I afraid of? Do I trust my home? Some people can really trust their homes. Um, some people cannot. For example, if you have roommates, um, then who, who casually invite you over? You cannot trust your home in the same way as somebody who owns their place um, and has a big hole on their door. Um, so then some people are going to be worried about um, be worried about like um, not being able to fall. Oh, yeah, I mean that's part of it, right? My dog ate my Bitcoin. <laughs> you gotta get a fireproof safe, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And I put all the hardware wallets yeah. in, all the yeah. iPods. Um, so I think we're some heroes. Huh? I think we're any heroes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I also saw my email. You have to change the wallet, well, because otherwise they take away um, the safe. There's lots of things to think about. But yeah. Six, you can put theoretically your money in your brain if you, uh, if you trust yourself in remembering it. I think we would all be healthy enough to be able to remember 12 words. And it's really doable. And we just don't trust ourselves with it, right? And 12 words is really not that difficult. People, people remember 12 addresses a year, right? For 10 years? Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Uh, thank you for sending some. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Leo, for the great presentation. Again, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the great uh, In case you are actually uh, you're new to Bitcoin, there's a ETF right, right there. Uh, at your office downstairs, you can try out. Uh, we wish you have a wallet to restore your Bitcoins. Uh, so thank you for coming. And uh, we will more events in the future. So uh, keep uh, just check out my uh, video. Thank you.